Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you join us today for our webinar on crowdfunding for economic development. My name is Susan Lowe. I'm with the Design Coordination and Outreach Branch of the Ministry of Jobs, Trade and Technology. I'll be moderating and providing technical support for today's webinar and moderating our question and answer sessions as well. I'm located in Victoria, BC, in the traditional territories of the Likwungan people, namely the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. So there's a couple of options for your audio today. Uh, many of you are connected via your computers, and some of you are connected via your phones. So if you're having problems with your bandwidth or your computer connection dropping, then you can click on the little radio button that says phone call, and it'll give you a dial-in number, an access code, and a unique PIN, which you can use uh, so that it's attached to your registration, so I can see your name and I can mute you or unmute you when we get to the discussion part of the presentation. Uh, a couple more things on the control panel here. You've got this lovely hide or unhide button, which lets you access your controls. It will, for some of you, disappear from your screen after the webinar has been going on for a while. You just click the orange arrow and we'll come back. Uh, the full screen, if you want to see us really big, and the raise hand button, if you want to let me know that you'd like to ask a question. However, uh, because there's many of you and there's only one of me, what I would suggest is that you type your question into this ask, enter a question for staff button and it comes up on my screen and I can either hold on to it and ask one of our speakers at the right time or I can type you back a really quick question if it's a technical issue. Um, and one of the most popular questions is, will the presentation slides be made available at the, the presentation? Yes. The whole presentation is being recorded and the slides will be made available on the BC Economic Development website, which is gov.bc.ca slash economic development. And it takes me about a week usually to get those up there, depending upon what's going on. Um, I'm heading to some conferences next week, so things might be a little delayed in sharing things, but I'll, I'll do my best to get that up there for you. Throughout the uh, presentation, there's going to be some pop quizzes and uh, some other polls to let us know about you. And these are going to come up as a poll on your screen. It will not be asking how many pets you have. I'm going to actually run a poll right now so you can get some practice answering and we can find out a little bit more about you. Um, I know from your registration and your email address is roughly where you're from. So we've got people from north, south, east, west, and the province. And let's find out more about what kind of roles that you take. So the poll is opening up asking, what is your role in economic development? And if you wouldn't mind, just uh, we want to get really good voter turnout on this because uh, that's important for civic engagement. Um, we'll get some idea of who we have in here. I usually leave these up for about 30 to 45 seconds. So if you're listening, but you're actually checking your email at the time, when you hear me talking about a poll being open, you want to hop back over, put in your answer or answers so that we can get really good voter turnout. Our system actually keeps track of whether or not you have GoToWebinar in focus on your screen or you're looking at something else. Now, I'm not going to call out anybody, but I do like to see my attentiveness stats get up there. So try to stay with us and we'll try to keep you really engaged. So we now have 88% voter turnout, and I'll close the poll, and I will share the results with you so you can see who's on the poll. So we've got about 36% are economic development officers in communities, 14% are with the community futures or other local agencies, 21% are with the provincial government, uh, hi colleagues, and 21% uh, with nonprofit or other business organizations, and 7% are that magical other. So thanks very much for sharing that part, and uh, we will carry on. So today's presentation is about crowdfunding, and at the end of this webinar, you will be able to, if you've paid attention and learned well, uh, describe what a crowdfunding campaign is and how it supports local economic development. You'll have a good idea of how to navigate the Invest Local BC crowdfunding site, and you will be able to identify best practices for organizing an effective crowdfunding campaign. And managing all of that learning for you is uh, our three presenters, Graham Stanley, who is the General Manager of Community Futures, Stuart Nachako. Uh, Tom Bulmer is going to be giving us a tour of the site. He's the CED Coordinator for Community Futures, Stuart Nachako. 
And Robert Podell of Vortex Social Marketing is going to be uh, talking about what makes a good crowdfunding campaign. Um, these three gentlemen have had a gr great fun to work with putting this together, and they have an enormous depth of knowledge about crowdfunding. So I know you're going to enjoy things. All right, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Graham, and he is going to talk about crowdfunding and, and how this all came about for Community Futures State at Jacko. There you Thank go, you, Graham. Susan. Thank you, Susan. Before we get started, um, I should acknowledge and will acknowledge that we are broadcasting from the traditional territory of the Sykes First Nation in Vanderhoof, BC. And uh, I wanted to get that in. And um, I'm here to talk about crowdfunding and the idea and the history of why we did this and why we have this in place. And I'm going to do that. I'll only spend about five minutes of your time, and then I'm turning it over to our other panelists who have a lot more in-depth knowledge that we need to be discussing than what I do. Um, Invest Local BC was an initiative that started in 2014. Initially, the idea was to uh, address fundraising activities required by nonprofits and arts and culture. Um, the reason for this is we, had a, we have a lot of clients that come into our office, Community Futures, and they ask, how do we get funded? How do we get funded? And the issue, of course, from, from what we've dealt with, with with large senior government is that they're looking to have some indication of community support. So we created the, initially the crowdfunding platform to allow to create community support for nonprofits and arts and culture. That's where we started. In 2015, the BC Securities Commission changed their rules to allow equity crowdfunding through a registered or an exempt portal. We are not a registered dealer of, of, of securities, but we offer a transaction for those people that want to do a do-it-yourself campaign to try and support an idea or an innovation in their community and in the greater BC. So that, that is why we started the thing. But what we've learned is that crowdfunding to us is part of a larger process. And that process is true secondary economic diversification. Diversification from our perspective comes from innovations and ideas and bringing them forward and bringing those ideas to the market or to the public to find out if we have support. Because not all ideas are profit motive. Other, there can be all types that would, that would find their way onto the site. We believe that it is a community development tool. And as a community development tool, we believe that it is the public that is going to drive this. If they think it's a good idea, it'll work. If they don't think it's a good idea, it's not going to work. We can understand that. Um, we have been going slow in the development process, as we talked about. As I mentioned, 2014 is when we started. People would argue and say, how come you're not farther? Well, one of the things was crowdfunding was at an infancy stage at that time and a lot of, not, a lot of, not a lot of awareness. We wanted to make sure that the scamming and all of the hype that comes with these type of things had gone through and that we could come up with a platform that is going to be a trusted platform in our communities. And that's what we're looking for, is developing the trust piece. That's why we've dragged our feet and have not been out running around the province with this program. However, that doesn't mean that time isn't coming to us to do it now. Um, it's a program that allows communities to embrace themselves and look after themselves. And that's what it's meant to be. Um, thanks. That's my speak. I hope to talk and answer some questions, but that's all I have at the moment. Thanks, Graham. Um, I, uh, I'll just take things over again here for a moment. We're going to have a demo by Tom, uh, who's going to show us the Invest Local BC platform. Um, before we go there, are there any questions from the audience? You can either raise your hand or type the question into the question box. Um, and also, if you forget your question now, but you want to ask it later, you can do that too. So, all right. 
Uh, Tom, I'm. Are you are you ready? Um, let me just unmute you here. There we go. You're unmuted. For uh, for my invest local BC, I have it in the background, but I seem to only have the webinar up front, and I can't seem to find it to get into the background. And I'm trying to shrink the uh, webinar uh, screen so I can get to my okay. uh, invest local BC screen so I can take you all on a tour. All right, I'm that. just gonna. Go, there we go. I think I found it. Okay, and I'm gonna make you the presenter so you can show us what's on your screen. We're going to get a magical tour of Invest Local BC. I don't know if any of the uh, people on the webinar have checked out the website in advance, but um, there's lots of pretty cool uh, projects up there. There's also, um, I, I find the, the combination of the equity financing and also the the nonprofit uh, donation financing, having those two things on the same site is, is quite powerful. And it's I think it sets this site apart from a site like uh, GoFundMe, where it's it's asking for a donation all the time. How are you doing, Tom? Oh, hang on. I got it. You have yourself muted. You have somehow muted yourself. Oh, we have your screen now. We, uh, your audio is still muted, unfortunately. I can't unmute you if you've muted yourself. Okay, uh, I think uh, maybe I oh. figured that one up. There we go. And I'm wondering now, can you see the screen of Invest Local BC? Yes, we do. Okay, this is Invest Local BC, and this is the screen that you would come to first when you uh, come to our site, which is investlocalbc.ca. And um, when we first got this going, uh, basically nonprofit and arts and culture were the two we were uh, concentrating on. As Graham had mentioned in 2015, the Securities Commission allowed businesses to take part. And then we added that site as well. Just to give you a bit of an indication, we were working, uh, we worked with some uh, successful ones. One of them was our very own Community Futures. We wanted to uh, run um, put together a video that explained a little bit about Invest Local BC. So what we did is we uh, started our own campaign. We were going to raise uh, $4,000 to have the video made. Uh, halfway through that, we changed our website to offer the business one. Therefore, what we had to do was close the campaign off on the original website and reopen it once again on the brand new one. And that left us a thousand dollars or so left to go. And we made that with the new one. So we did about three quarters of it on the old website. We did about a quarter of it on this new website. This is the new website. And I must caution you that uh, this is what it looks like now, but it is going to change once again. We have our IT guy working on some new ideas for Invest Local BC, and that, that'll be coming shortly. Just a quick review of the uh, front page here. Uh, you can start your campaign immediately by hitting this uh, little button up top here where it says start a campaign. You can also ask questions and find out more about Invest Local BC under the about, and you can explore the various categories, which of course are all down here as well. Uh, nonprofit and arts and culture are fairly uh, self-explanatory. Um, if you are running, say, uh, a historical society and maybe you need a new porch for one of your buildings or something like that, you can go on the nonprofit one and you can follow all the instructions. The site is rather intuitive and basically all you have to do is answer the questions. We'll get into that in just a moment. The arts and culture one, very much the same, but a different category. Perhaps you want to put out a new video or you've done yourself a CD. I know CDs are on their way out and pretty soon we won't have CDs anymore. Uh, okay, perhaps you want a book or an ebook or something like that and you need funding to get it off the ground. The arts and culture area is where you would go. Basically, it boils it down so that uh, people who are looking for uh, something that might want to uh, get, uh, they might want to get involved with a book or with a music project or something like that. They can go to arts and culture. If they want to get involved with a fair or a historical society or some other community project, they would go to nonprofit. Now, the business one is a little different. The business one is the one where you can actually start up a business and this, you can crowdfund your equity in the, in the business. I'm going to click on that one now, and of course, you'll get the first part of it, 
is in a very important uh, warning from us and from the Securities Commission that we don't offer any advice on any of the projects that show up on Invest Local BC. So you have to understand that and that you're willing to continue. Then you have to pick whether you're doing an equity campaign, non-equity campaigns. Since the inception of this, we have not had any equity campaigns here on Invest Local BC. We are working with that and we do actually work with people where we uh, direct them to uh, other sources that can really help out with equity campaigns. On that, we uh, have a, a couple here on the uh, non-equity side that actually, we have one that just started up recently here um, a little while ago. And uh, these two here actually worked out quite well uh, for uh, uh, this one here, especially worked out very well for a, a lady out west of us who is doing a pet to vet or a vet to pet mobile pet service. So once you choose which way you want to go and perhaps you want to uh, start an equity campaign, it we should start now and now, let's just get into that now. So, and it offers you once again, you can either start an equity campaign or does not offer equity. <clears throat> Excuse me, the one that does not offer equity is regular campaigning sim uh, similar to uh, the nonprofit organizations and uh, the uh, arts and culture projects where you would offer uh, perks and, and things like that to get involved. The equity one, of course, is one where you would offer equity in your business. So the people who actually get involved with it become a part of your business. Whereas in the non-equity ones, they do not become part of your business. So you choose the one you want there and let's just go into the equity one. And uh, I will show you quickly that it is very, very uh, intuitive. You type in the title of your, your equity campaign, what it may be, your goal that you would like to reach, the length of days, and the maximum is 90 days. The rules on this are set out by the Securities Commission and that. So uh, you, does you do you have a business plan available? You should have uh, your cash flow forecast. If you talk to Graham, you definitely should have a cash flow uh, forecast. If you want to pick a certain region of the province that you want to aim at, this is available down here. I believe on our new site, we will remove this and just go with all of BC for all of our campaigns. But at the moment, you can choose if you would like to do it in the Caribou, you'd like to do it on the island or the, uh, Victoria, that sort of thing. You can choose from there. Once you have all of that, uh, you move on. Um, I guess we could uh, we we could uh, start a campaign and and uh, move along, but that would take far too long for us to do this. So that's basically the equity campaign ones. If you're doing one that doesn't offer equity campaign, once again you hit the create campaign button. Wants me to select one region and let's go home here. So I'll pick. Uh, I'll pick the Nachaka one because we're going home here. We would create a campaign here. Once again, this will come up and it will give you a hand. We have a very, very helpful website that can give you basics. It can get you quite in depth to help out with your campaign. But Robert is going to be talking about that uh, a lot more. On our site, you would have the basics of your campaign, the story you want to tell. Tell your story. Make people want to get involved with whatever campaign it is. This would go for whether you're uh, doing an equity campaign or a perks-based campaign. Uh, then you get into the details of the campaign, how long you want it to run, the funding, what type of funding uh, are you going to offer with it, and what type of perks are you going to offer with it, and the review, and then you'll be able to launch your website. And basically, uh, without us actually building a campaign here today, which would take a, a little bit of time, they usually take uh, between half an hour and 45 minutes to do, that would take up uh, too much of our time. So um, basically, I think that would be our website and uh, that would be our website. And that's basically how you maneuver through it and what you do to uh, get to where you want to go. I uh, wanted to uh, point out on our uh, on our main campaign, and I'm going to do that now on our main page here, uh, get out of the campaign one 
and just go uh, back to Invest Local BC itself. And uh, point out one that I think Robert is, is uh, quite familiar with as well. And that was uh, on uh, the one that was uh, for the hub in Prince George. They did a very good campaign and they happened to pick a very good time to do it. And that was the vault here. Uh, what they wanted to do was create a place where you could actually uh, come on into their building, uh, go into a vault, which actually was a vault because it used to be a Royal Bank building. And uh, they created a, a uh, room in there where you could do internet content, whether you're doing it for YouTube or Facebook or what have you, uh, you could actually go in there and do that. And they uh, picked a, a wonderful place to launch it. They uh, did it at the Comic-Con type uh, event in Prince George at the time. So they had a lot of people going by the booth and a lot of people looking into that. So uh, that's just the basics of how our website works. What I'd like to do now is turn it over to Robert to show you how uh, the vault was successful, quite successful. It says here that they raised 4000 That was their goal. They actually raised $4,030. So they did go over it. And uh, Robert can now tell you how you take that and turn it into a uh, successful campaign. Thanks, Tom. Um, before we go, I have a couple of questions for you uh, about the Invest Local BC. Can you show me how, uh, if I had a campaign on the site, how can I send people to my campaign? Where do I, where do I find the link or something like that if I want to let someone know how to actually get there and send me some Okay, let, I, uh, most of these campaigns have expired. I will try this one here and see if I can show you how to do that. Okay, so right now he's, uh, the, the fellow has uh, $300 raised in there. And down here you will see uh, links to, uh, you can share it on the Facebook, there's the Twitter, uh, feed and the others as well. So you can go through social media that way. There is also a link here where you can email links to people as well. So there's uh, actually with uh, when you think about it, almost any way that you can do uh, to get people to come to your site, you can do it through Facebook, Twitter, emailing a link. Um, the link here is to put into a website. Perhaps you have a website to go along with it, which we do suggest you, you have a website to go along with it. You can take this link here, embed it in your website, and have people click on it. You can hit the email and send them that link, uh, and you can share it on Twitter and others as well. So that's, that's how you would do that, Susan. Great. Thank you. And there was uh, a couple of other questions that came in. Um, one of them was about social enterprises and whether they would go under nonprofits or business on the site. I think if I was a social enterprise one, I would go into the uh, business site and uh, go under the non-equity end of it. Okay. And what's the average fundraising goal on the website? Um, the average fundraising goal for us is rather uh, small. We do between $5,000 and $10,000. Back in uh, 2015, the Canadian government released a report called Hive Wire, and um, I'm waiting for them to update it, actually, now that some more numbers have come in over the years and uh, changed that. But they found that um, if your campaign was under $11,000, you had an 89% more chance of being successful than those over that. Now, uh, you will hear crowdfunding campaigns that have gone way out to lunch. For example, I would like to cite the case of Humble and how that uh, a crowdfunding campaign on right. GoFundMe actually did so well for them. Um, uh, there are ones that do go and get extraordinary amounts of money, but those are uh, the exception to the rule. Okay, and does the website take an admin fee? Yes, we do. Uh, we, we charge basically the same as any of the others, and uh, that, that is about uh, 3% or so, 5%. And then, of course, you have to also pay for a PayPal or Stripe or one of those to have the, the uh, uh, finance handlers. So I always tell people to look at about 10%. That's a little over what uh, all of those fees together would be but I tell people to look at a 10% uh, increase in what they're asking for. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna run a quick poll here to get people 
uh, feeding back to us. And uh, before we get on to Robert's content, so my question is, have you ever run a crowdfunding or online fundraising campaign? So let's collect up some responses here and see where we've got our people. We've got 68%. Oh, this is great, Voter Turner, aren't you guys? I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm one of those people who go out there and try to get my friends to vote. So I like to see good high voter turnout. All right, so we've got uh, over 90% of our attendees have voted. That is fabulous. Makes me so happy. And we have, here's the, uh, the results of that, uh, about 22% said yes, they have run a crowdfunding or online funding, funding campaign. Uh, no, but I'd be willing to try. Uh, so there we go, a little background information. So uh, next up, thank you for the questions, everyone. Keep them coming. Next up, we've got uh, Robert Quibell, who's going to talk about uh, how to actually make this work. What do you have to do to prepare your campaign and, uh, and, and get it going? Robert, are you, are you ready to go? I'm turning over the controls to you. Oh, I should unmute you. That would be nice. There we go. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure that I get the right screen. Oh, oh there we go. I'll get this out of the way. Um, so can you see the screen? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, I called it the mutable rules or mutable laws of crowdfunding. And the reason why I did was I've been reading the immutable laws of just about everything in marketing and branding. And in, I don't want to, you know, one of the things I want to tell everybody right up front is, although we have not always reached the, the money, the amount of money during the campaign that we had hoped for, um, every one of the campaigns that we've worked on has been funded in some way fully funded, um, usually by someone coming in later. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that at the end. But the first thing I want you to realize is these things are not easy. They're hard. Um, money doesn't fly in. Yes, there's exceptions. Um, I think there's exceptions in everything, but it, it doesn't, they don't, it doesn't just fall in. Um, you need to raise between 20 and 30% ahead of time. There's a couple of reasons for it. One is to cover, you're gonna to need to spend some money on advertising. Um, and the, the more the media gets involved, the better it is for you. I suggest a lot of PR. So where do you go for that? The typical the, is to reach out to friends and family. And the other, one of the people that I often find that don't contribute, unfortunately, is the person who's putting it on. Um, and they need to contribute because you need to show that you've got some skin in the game. And even though you've put all the time and all that work in there, you need to know that they are part of it as well. Um, the other one is uh, as you're raising the money, you're going to start perfecting that message because you're not going to have a you're not going to have a perfect message in the beginning. It's just not. Nobody does. Um, usually those perfect over the first couple of weeks, you start to get more, more of the wording that you want to use it. People start saying, hey, you know, I hadn't thought about this or I thought about this or um, different ways to look at your project. And it really helps you perfect your message. Um, and it gets more people involved because the more people you have involved walking around, talking to people, working with you, the better it is for your campaign in the, in the long run. And this is the last thing I'll say. If you can't get them involved, there's two, there's two challenges that you're having. Either you need to change the story, or maybe the project's not viable, and you may need to look at doing it a different way. There's like when you go through a camp and, and there, and you get to that point where you feel that it's not going to work. It's it's awful because then you try to scramble. So that pre time that you do ahead of time it really makes a difference as to whether or not your campaign's going to work. Um, and you need everybody involved. Um, if people aren't, if you can't get everybody involved, it's too hard. Um, the because you need if you have a board they definitely need to be involved and they ne definitely need to put money in it doesn't have to be a whole bunch of money it's not about the amount of money it's about that the fact that they took part the average donation in a in a campaign most of them are between 25 and 100 dollars um, so it's not a great deal of money but it when even if someone puts in ten dollars it shows that they have faith in your project and you have to realize that those people are really standing by you and they're showing you that you've got something um, which is even more exciting because it actually creates a whole bunch of goodwill in the community. Um, this can't be a side project on the side of your desk. It doesn't work. Lots of people, when we start working with them, they go, well, you know, I'll just do the off the side of your desk. You can't. 
you have to be out there talking to people. You have to be out there getting things going. You have to be doing even some of the traditional types of fundraising should be done alongside this because that will get your campaign going in even further. And every platform will allow you to do what they call offlining, which is where they take you take the money that you've raised on, say, in a fundraiser or something, and you you take it and you put it into the campaign, but you don't have to pay fees on it, but it shows. The best way to do those is show everybody who put money in, because the more people you have putting in money, the more social proof you have for the project itself. Um, and if you hire a consultant, they can't do it all, even though we'll all try, but we can't. Um, there needs to be something for everybody. It needs to be something for the people who are helping you. There needs to be something to, for the people who are contributing. Um, and, and I think sometimes we forget that that part, that those people who are contributing need to have some feeling that they're doing um, some good or or helping you in some way. Because people like to help, but if if you don't clearly show them how you're gonna, they're gonna help you, especially in a business raise. Um, we did one in the States um, where they're look, they were working with realtors and it's been a very successful um, campaign. Um, we didn't re raise the million dollars, we, we got a third of it, but, um, it, it was successful because he got out there and talked with people, got people involved, showed the realtors how they, they were going to be able to help this project go. Um, and since then, there's been several people who have come out outside of the crowdfunding to come and help them actually their, launch their website. And I think they just launched it just recently. I think in the last few weeks, they launched it, but we weren't part of the launch of the website. Um, the thing about it is there's a pre-launch period and the pre-launch period can be anywhere from one month to three months. Um, a lot of people think that if you go on to uh, uh, any of the of the funding sites and you just throw something up, um, money will flow. And it's, it's, it's always really heartbreaking when you see those because they, they have, um, it's, you, you can see it. They just, they just crash because they haven't gone out and raised the money ahead of time. So what are you gonna do with that 20 to 30% before you begin? You're going to use it to start putting it into your to start putting into your campaign, and you're going to list the people that are doing it because people like to help other people who, who um, when they see other people helping them. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I strongly suggest, um, especially if you have a nonprofit or a business, make sure that you've got. Um, I, I believe, uh, uh, Graham, you use Stripe as well. I wasn't sure whether you use WePay or PayPal, but. Um, make sure that that's all set up before you get in there because sometimes the accountant can take like weeks to get back to you or to set this up and it can be a real problem and it delayed one of our one of our campaigns by almost two weeks because they had to get all that paperwork done. And anyone who's worked in this area knows that's the first thing you do when you walk in with a with a client who's trying to start a campaign. You say, we got to get the PayPal and all that stuff or do you have it? Um, the so the square I totally recommend that you get a square account for your pre-launch money um, because people don't carry cash anymore um, and it's a way that you can raise money. You can later on you can put it onto the crowdfunding site. You have to get you have to go through the crowdfunding companies or if the consultant has a, the ability to do that, they can put it on for you. But you you need a way that you can collect cash quickly because you really need this is. I, I, I literally now will not help somebody or coach somebody if they haven't if they don't commit to doing 20% or 30% ahead because it's too hard. And if you have a choice between 100 people giving you $25 or even five, um, get the 100 people um, as opposed to getting one donation for $2,500. Because if you show one donation of $2,500, everybody goes, oh, well, that's just the big guy. And, or however they read it. I don't know how they read it. Um, it just works better if you have more people. Robert, before you go on, can you explain what a Square account is for us? A Square account is um, it's a type of payment plan that you can use. If you get a little a little cube square that goes on top of your phone, and you can you can take payments from people when you're on your phone. Um, and it, I'm suggesting this before you start your campaign because especially in the beginning because this the sooner you get start people starting believing in you or it's like even when you're doing a re regular type of um, fundraising when you get those first few people putting money in you and you actually get the confidence there it's great 
but not everybody carries cash. So sometimes you can get a check or whichever. Um, that all works, but if you have Square, um, it's just a way that they can get money much quicker. So it's a little uh, device. It's literally yeah, inch by know. inch plastic yeah, white device in. Square. And you plug it into the, it goes into the headphone jack of your phone, I believe. And yep. it is a credit card reader. So yep. from anywhere you are, you can take people's credit cards or their debit cards, I believe, and get yep. their money in your account just like that. So there's no more Uncle Bob says, I'm going to give you $35. Great. I'll take it right now. Oh, I haven't got cash. Don't worry, Uncle Bob. I've got this square machine. And you can get it right yep. there at dinner time. It's perfect. It's, um, it's surprising how quickly they'll say yes, too, when, yeah. when you have that. Um, so the other part of the, the pre-launch is, um, depending on how you're doing it and type of campaign, it can take up to a third of the money that you raise to raise the money that you raise. So if you want to raise $60,000, $60, you have to raise as much as $90,000 to cover the cost of the campaign so that you have, get your $60,000. And you need to be aware of that. Um, just there's like, there's uh, the platform fee. There's, if you have to run ads, um, the best we've ever experienced was we did a political campaign back in Saskatchewan, and for every dollar that we uh, we spent, we got 11 back. Um, and the the amount of money that we spent in the campaign actually was one third of the um, contribution or one third of the ads they ran in social media were through our crowdfunding, which actually helped the person get into the position they got in. Um, videos are important, but your story is more important. Um, a lot more important. Get media involved. PR, like seriously, get as much PR as you can and as much people in that room when you're launching as you can because the more people there, um, the more more credibility you're going to have and the more people are going to say, oh, this is something that, you know, not just me sees it as a good idea. All these other people see it as a good idea too because it is kind of a social media in its own way. It's just a way of raising money that way. It's always like the I'll tell two friends and you tell two friends and they'll tell two friends and it, that really works. And the other thing is make sure you donate. Um, it's it's sort of a frustration of mine if the person says that they're not willing to donate into their project. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't feel that the commitment's there and I don't care how much, they just need to donate something. Um, on day one, you need lots of donations, and in a perfect world, you get 100 of them. Now, I know that's that's hard, and, and it's probably not going to happen, but I'm going to tell you to aim for 100, and if you get 20 or 30, then that's a good start. Um, and there's lots of strategies to make that happen, um, and there's tons of stuff online that will will tell you um, how, to, how, how to approach that. Um, and your donors can be your biggest fans. If you can get a donor who's given you money to start helping you with your campaign and talking to people, it is like the very best. They're like the best. Like literally you can, some of the people when they when they get really excited about your project, rather than saying, oh, well, thank you very much for the donation. And they're talking about how great it is. You say, well, do you want to help? Don't forget to ask because they, they, are, they can literally turn a campaign around. Um, in one of our campaigns, we had a, one of the directors get really, really excited and a third of the donations came from um, herself or her friends. It was incredible. Um, and remember, you can keep the offline donations, which means that when you get a check, you can phone Graham. I think that's how it works, Graham. You might have to clarify. You can phone Graham and say, I got this check for this amount. Can you offline it for me? So he'll put the donation in, put the person's name in. Um, also, when people do donate, say something, don't just ignore them. That's awful when people do that. Um, and, it, and it should be someone from your organization. We've often done it as consultants, but it's much better when it comes from someone who's in the organization. Um, and you can do sub campaigns. I'm not sure if you can do sub campaigns on and thus local. I think you can, but I'm not sure. And they're just like little mini campaigns. So here's my two biggest, what, uh, takeaways um, from all of this and I saw that several people were interested in giving it a try and here's why I think you should um, regardless of how much money you raise 
they're always successful and they're always successful t for two reasons. One is two very large projects that are, uh, one of them that's about, that was just announced a few days down in downtown Prince George. Um, the beginning talks of that started through a crowdfunding that's actually on Invest Local. Um, and now they've gone into a bigger, um, they're actually gonna have a big site downtown. Um, and what they were looking to do was to actually fix up their old location. And now they've actually found them another location, which, you know, you could say maybe it didn't come from that, but I know the talk started shortly, or actually they actually started during the campaign. And then the last one, um, we we did one to help one of the one of the local um, community uh, groups that wanted to help children. And that campaign, uh, we finished the campaign and the provincial government stepped in later to help because they saw the need was there, because they saw how much effort they put into it. Um, and then the other thing was a political campaign where one third of the ads that they had run um, or the, the money that they had spent in social media was spent by us raising the money, the, raising the, raising the money for the, for, for the campaign, um, help that person literally get into office. So we could, we could actually track it. And we, at that point we were getting for every dollar we spent, we were getting 11 back, which was really cool. I thought that was amazing. And I think I want to stop there because I'm sure people have lots of questions. I know I didn't go into tactics, but there's tons of tactical stuff. But if you follow those rules there, you'll find that that your your project will be way more successful. Cool. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, yeah, we had a couple of questions, and I'm actually going to open up. I'm going to unmute all of our speakers here, and uh, I've got a couple of questions and. Feel free to keep them coming in on the question thing. I'm, I'm reading them and translating them. One of the questions we had, and I think this is probably for Graham or Tom, is would this, uh, would a crowdfunding campaign or would Invest Local BC be a good opportunity for communities that got turned down uh, for planning grants from the Rural Dividend Fund, which are for feasibility studies or uh, drawings for uh, downtown revitalization, other um, the, the the planning grants are for communities with limited capacity to undertake the preliminary work to develop strong applications for future funding intakes. Um, is this the sort of platform, or would would you guys recommend that communities look at this for that kind of funding? It depends on who you're who you're trying to reach. In in the case of what you're you're asking, the question is. Will the community members, the local community members, support a feasibility study into one of these projects? Because if you haven't got the public uh, feeling that they want to support this, then it's going to go nowhere. Um, so, but will it, 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 to me, it comes down to how you uh, articulate the ask and, and also, again, back to what Robert was talking about, running an effective campaign. Those are the two things. The, uh, the Invest Local, would it be uh, a, a site to do that? Sure it would. But you still have to direct your people to that site and, and involve the whole community. So it sounds like if you've got a vision, if your community shares a vision and you've had a lot of engagement prior to putting together your, uh, your funding application, uh, then you may already have the steps in place for a good campaign. But if it's just yeah. something that you and a small team put together a grant application, didn't get the grant, you still have a lot more work to do before you can have a successful campaign. Right. I'll give you an example of one that I've mused around myself. And this is a, just a top of mind one. We haven't done it yet. But the idea is what about a feasibility study for a refinery providing a gasoline to uh, BC? Maybe a crowdfunding thing where local community support people will get a copy of the, the feasibility study once it's done for investing in the process. Okay. So it, it's really, when they say crowd, they really do mean crowd. They mean a, a broad population of people having interest in supporting the projects. Uh, yeah. So a couple of... Now other, when, when, oh. Sorry, I was just going to say, when Tom mentioned our... Uh, Community Futures uh, ask that we put on an Invest Local BC for the development of a video. 
what we did is that crowd was very specific. We only went and solicited funds from other community futures offices. So sometimes you have to identify your crowd and identify what you're actually asking for. Okay. A um, couple of other questions. Why is Invest Local better than other platforms? I, I would like to answer that one if you don't mind. Um, the Invest Local BC is good for people who are trying to engage local people to invest in local people. So uh, this one here has a very local feel to it. And Robert, I think, can attest to this, that if you have a crowd uh, that is very local and you're going out to your local crew right around uh, your town, your region, um, you're going to find a lot more success than taking it out to Berlin or mm -hmm. Dallas, Texas, or where have you. And Invest Local BC pinpoints and aims right at your local town, your local region, your local area. And so if you're doing something quite local like that, and, and perhaps um, you're, you're not, maybe you're doing a brand new type of bicycle that everybody in the world will want then uh, for sure, go after uh, the Kickstarter, the Indiegogo, something like that. But if you're trying to do a small video, say, to uh, promote your uh, the Chaco Valley Rodeo, uh, then you want to go to the local people in your town to invest in that local project. And that is why it is termed Invest Local BC. Okay. Um, I think, I, oh, I think that um, you're, you're really right because Everyone thinks that the that donation comes from like California or New York or wherever, and they don't. They come from people locally, and that's why even in the beginning, why I'd say like start out there, because people once you start getting people talking about it, and it, and and that audience, if you know who they are, so if it's if it's a local project, it's something that's going to happen. People help people locally, then you're going to get a lot of support. If that's where if that's where your 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 platform is bigger I have a very interesting story I can add to that Robert um, and that came from Alex Cormick she is a securities lawyer and uh, she told us the story of the Boston boat uh, the Boston boat was w when the uh, Boston Marathon tragedy happened and they found uh, the bad guy in a fellow's boat in his backyard they basically shot up his boat pretty badly uh, there were two campaigns that started for uh, that guy to uh, get him his boat back. One was, um, and I can't remember if it was Indiegogo or, or uh, Kickstarter or one of those ones, it was a, one of the bigger ones. And there was a local regional small Boston uh, platform as well. The big one raised about $3,000. The small local one, because it was local and aimed at being a local thing around the Boston area, raised over 50000 for his boat. So. Um, that was just one story that Alex told on how uh, local will help you out if that's what you're after. Okay. Um, is this an all or nothing funding idea? So if you don't reach your target, uh, the money isn't collected? Because I know there's some platforms that do that. You have to get it all if you, get, if you want the money. Invest Local BC is both. Oh. You can, yeah, Invest Local BC, you can choose whether you want an all or nothing campaign or you can choose a keep what you get campaign. Uh, they're both valuable for various reasons. Um, most people in the, uh, in the um, hive wire report that I mentioned earlier uh, uh, will give you the stats that the all or nothing campaigns will seem to draw more money more quick because people seem to have uh, the idea that you're more invested in it and that you have to get it done and you have to get it done soon. And so it, it becomes an urgency issue. Um, in any advertising campaign, urgency is always uh, an issue. And so the um, all or nothing campaigns seem to uh, lend that way. However, if you do a keep what you make campaign, uh, what Graham was saying about getting your word out there and um, just basically using it as a promotion and as a, an awareness campaign, that can be used in that way. What do you do if uh, you've taken money offline or through other ways and uh, you don't end up moving the project forward? How do you return the money? Or do you? You don't. Oh. 
Yes, the money would be the money would definitely be returned if it's an all or nothing campaign. Okay. If it's a keep what you make campaign, of course, you keep what you make. Keep and um, if it's if it's been done offline, um, you would go to whoever it was that you were giving your money to, and they will have a way of doing it. We have a way through Invest Local BC to do that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Can I just add something there? The platform itself is not responsible for returning funds. The arrangement for the campaign is between the campaigner and the donor. Okay, so the, it's the campaigner that decides whether to send the funds back and, are, and arranges for that to happen. That's up to them. Okay, great. Um, a couple of other questions. Um, one person would love to hear some of the tactical steps for an equity campaign. Maybe, Robert, because we don't have a huge amount of time, maybe you can suggest some uh, great resources for that or one or two off the top of your head that are, are good tactical moves. I, I, I haven't actually worked in, the, in, the, um, in the, the equity part, so it's not really an area. I'm, I'm more familiar with either reward, um, well, mostly reward, um, so I'm not as familiar with the with the equity side. Okay. Susan, hmm? may, I ask, may I ask how much equity? Uh, it makes a big difference because there's a cost of, of developing a security for the public, even if it's crowdfunded, there's a cost to doing that. So there's a threshold that, um, that you have to reach before it, it makes any sense to do equity crowdfunding, to be honest with you. Okay. Now, the only the thing that I will mention is that if you're looking to do proof of concept development, where we're talking about pre-commercial projects, then crowdfunding part of it to develop awareness and backers might be an, 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 a, a worthwhile thing. But here's the thing. You can start off by a proof of concept through Invest Local, successfully raise money for your next stage of fund fundraising, and then transfer over to Front Funder, which is one of our affiliated organizations that we work with, who are an exempt market dealer. The reason why we would move you towards an exempt market dealer, if we're looking for a big ask at equity crowdfunding, is because they can market the investment. They are structured in that way, that they can actually market an investment. So we give the client in the small town the opportunity to be in, in, in front of those venture capitalists and other types of investors. Okay. It sounds like there's a connection here that I'm going to make uh, after the webinar, which I love, by the way, when that happens as a result of the webinar. So I'm going to connect you and this question asker offline because it sounds like there's a specific project at mind. Um, another question, at what point in your project should you start the funding campaign? I, I would suggest that, I mean, you have to know, um, you have to know exactly what you're doing. Um, do you, if it, I, I actually think you start, you're, you're, you're fundraising ahead. It's just, you're not using the platform yet. So it's almost to look at like your, your, your campaign is actually going to be four months long, but the last month's going to be online. Um, and so the beginning, beginning part, you have to be really clear what you want to do and what's, what everybody's going to get from it. So if someone donates, what are, what are they going to get out of it? Um, whether it's um, just feeling like they've helped in a, in a tragic situation, um, which is very, very powerful. It's one of the most powerful ones. Um, are they going to get something that they find that is very valuable as far as a, a reward? Um, is, it, is it going to help your move a cause that they feel very closely for, for forward and the more focused you are the easier it is actually to raise money lots of people say oh well let's go as broad as we can but that's doesn't work it's just like advertising if you don't know your audience then you um, and I think you kind of have to look at it that that way I think for economic development projects I think this is great because I was just thinking about those two projects and one was definitely it's going to be um, a long-term economic project that will impact Prince George um, but it's that project was very much driven I mean, I think it was in the back of people's minds, but it's sort of when it's the back of their mind, nothing ever happens. And it's not until people move it to the front of their minds that you actually start seeing some of these projects go forward more. So it sounds to me like if you're doing a project, um, 
that you want to have a strategy for the project. And then when you identify that there's a, a combined element of funding need and uh, like public buy-in or, or hearts and minds, you want to do yeah. friend raising as well as fundraising. When you have those two things combined, then you start thinking about, okay, at some point in this project, we're going mm -hmm. to use crowdfunding because not only is it going to raise some of the some of the money that we need, it is also going to raise the public awareness of the project, uh, and that in itself is its own objective. Yeah, well, we actually there's one that we've we that and that I'm working on right now that will use the very last end of it. We need another, about another three thousand dollars, but we've already raised the previous twenty five thousand ahead of time. Um, but we'll use, we'll go to invest local to finish the funding off because there's definitely interest there, but um, it's just to, to to get the rest of the money to finish the project off, we'll, we'll, we'll go to front um, to invest local for help. Okay, great. And, and uh, part of that, back to um, that question about why invest local BC over the others is that um, invest local BC was started by Graham um, and Community Future Stuart Nachaco in 2014 to further um, uh, projects in our smaller towns. And we are not a for-profit organization. We are not here to uh, collect the, the money simply to build up a bank account. We are here to try and move those projects forward in the towns. And so uh, that has to do with both the equity campaigns and non-equity campaigns. We will try and help you move it forward whichever way you want to go. Right. And can I ask all the participants one thing? Sure, go ahead. Share our link. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, we've got a couple of pop quizzes here. I'm going to launch one of our one of our quizzes uh, as a poll, just for you people who have uh, decided you're going to grab a snack here. Which of the following are important ingredients of a crowdfunding campaign? You can choose more than one option, as many as you like. There's some trick answers in there. I'm going to give you a warning. Although they're, they're tricks, but they're, they're tricks in disguise because I think that celebrating your, uh, celebrating the people who've, who've supported your project uh, is an important part of a crowdfunding campaign, wouldn't you say, Robert? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you don't want to be party free. You just want to be perhaps not a massive gala. And uh, maybe actually, I'd love to hear about perks. How do you know what types of perks to put into a crowdfunding campaign? So, uh, again, it's, that would depend, I think, on on exactly what you're uh, doing. Um, if you don't mind. I'll just grab something here off my desk. Um, we, we, we have an air show coming up in Vanderhoof, and uh, this here would be uh, one of the perks uh, we might think about on our um, on our crowdfunding campaign. It's um, done by a local fellow who does laser engraving on wood, and um, we were thinking of offering this. Uh, he did a very good job on the logo, but he stuck the year on it. And so that would make it a very unique thing. Um, you can't walk into a store and pick that up. It's not like a keychain or something of that nature that you can just drop into a store and pick up on. That would be only something that you would get through a crowdfunding campaign. And those are the kind of perks you want to look for, I think. Hey, eh, Robert, the things that are yeah. unusual, different, unique. And inexpensive. Like, you don't want to go really That's expensive. Right. I think. I, I think that was one of the biggest lessons I learned is don't don't go high value um, rewards. There you might get someone or you may have one big one, but don't have a whole bunch of big ones because it's it people will actually even if you have a reward campaign, people will just send you money. It it does happen. Um, it, and sometimes if you're it, it, people usually donate our donations are between 25 and 100 dollars so you've got to keep it something where you're going to make something out of that between 25 and 100 dollars so yeah if you're if you're not, it costs you half of the, the yeah, uh, yeah. Donation, then it's yeah. not worth it yeah so on that last poll you did the very last uh choice there do you go for lavish prizes and uh, perks i i would vote no <laughs> 
Yeah, no. I, I recall one of my favorite ca crowdfunding campaigns that I saw was to raise money for um, a movie that was going to be made uh, out of an Australian TV show called Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries. And one of the perks was actually you would get a copy of a costume sketch from uh, from the movie. And the costumes on the on the TV show were one of the highlights for a lot of viewers. It was it was all 1920s fashion. So that sort of thing is, you know, they can just run off these sketches, you know, they just print them out of their, their computer. But I would, you know, if I donated, a, I think $100, I get this sketch mailed to me. Um, so things like that, that are going to make the, the donator feel like they're a piece of the project, or yeah. behind the scenes on the project, that sort of thing is, is really helpful. Um, I have Susan, one more. To really oh, illustrate this, I would like to pass along one more, if you don't mind. All I right. would encourage everyone to Google Zach Danger Brown's potato salad. <laughs> Google that and have a look at that campaign. He only asked for ten dollars. I think okay. he made fifty-five thousand, or it might be still going. It's been a couple of years now, and I think he's still trying to catch up <laughs> with that one. But Google Zach Danger Brown and the potato salad. And the potato salad. All right. Well, uh, folks, we have one more poll here. And that this is me asking, what are you going to do with this information next? What's your next step to use this information? I know some of you guys are packing up from lunch and, and going to your next meetings. But I'd love to hear how you're going to use uh, what you learned today on the webinar. There's five choices. Uh, you can answer honestly. Some of the questions are, you know, what we sometimes do with, with what we've learned from webinars. Don't forget, you will be able to come back and watch this webinar again in the future, and uh, it'll be recorded. We post the recordings to YouTube uh, not long after the actual session. So, um, And I while... think any one of our panelists here, if you want to ask us questions directly, yes. by all means, you can get a hold of Graham, myself, or Robert. Yep, uh, Graham and Tom are at Community Future, Stuart Nachako, and uh, Robert, well, if people want to reach Robert, they can they can email us, uh, email me, and I'll put you in touch. Um, so I'm going to close the poll now, and uh, we have the very honest responses. 21% uh, are supporting a crowdfunding campaign in their community. 93% are consider using crowdfunding for a mid or long term project idea. Uh, fortunately, we have nobody needing to rescue a crowdfunding campaign that's not going too well. 64% uh, are helping people they serve at getting better at crowdfunding, and 21% are going to write it all down and hope you remember it in the future. Thank you for your honesty. That's very good of you. So um, we have a few more. I'm just going to check here that people are seeing my screen. Yes, you are. That's beautiful. So upcoming webinars. Yay. I've been uh, having a great time like I did with these gentlemen. I'm planning this. The next session is May 31st, Economic Development with Business Improvement Areas uh, with Gay Pooler from downtown Kamloops Business Improvement Area and Terry James from uh, Langley. And we're going to be looking at how to build them, uh, what kind of leadership is required, and how they interact with economic development in your areas. Um, I will not doing one in the middle of May because I'm going to be going on the road. So I'll be in Fort Nelson next week at the North Coast Local Government Association meeting at the trade show booth. So come and say hi if you're going to be at that event. And then the following week, I'll be at the Local Government Management Association in Victoria. Once again, come and say hi at the, at the trade show if you're um, going to be at those events. Uh, the, uh, there are a couple of things going on in the meantime. I want to talk about these things coming up May 8th and May 15th. Uh, the link is here. You have to write it down because, unfortunately, you can't click my links. But Small Business BC has put together this series on disaster proofing your small business. Uh, so this might be something that you want to recommend to people in your communities. Um, the, the research that's been done, the scuttlebutt I've heard is that uh, there are far too many small businesses who know they should have a continuity plan, and they don't. So this is um, really getting down to it. Uh, if you got this webinar invitation from somewhere random in the ether and you want to make sure that you don't miss any future uh, webinar invitations, write down this link, cm.pn slash 3inj 
so people friendly uh, and sign up and that will make sure that you get those invitations. I usually send them out about three weeks before the session. Uh, I've talked about this before, but we have them ongoing this year is the Tech Dev 101 workshops. And this is an opportunity to gather people in your community and talk about what your sort of technology and innovation ecosystem is and how to build capacity in your community. It, it gets down to a really hyper local level of discussion about technology and innovation. Um, so we bring the facilitators and the show to you and you help us by finding a venue and also making sure that the right people are in the room. So email us economicdevelopment at gov.bc.ca if you want to request a workshop in your community. If there has been one very, very close to you recently, we may not be able to come back. Um, we are not, unfortunately, able to do endless shows, but uh, we'll do it back. Oh, someone asked, can I bring back the invitation link, please? There it is, cm.pn slash 3inj. I'll leave that up for one more minute. We're almost done here. Here we go. Uh, after this webinar, uh, please complete the feedback survey that will pop up. Uh, metrics, metrics, metrics. I love metrics. And uh, we will record, we have been recording this webinar and it'll be posted in about a week to the gov.bc.ca slash economic development website, where you can also go and find out about our upcoming webinars. And there is a link also on that page directly to that invitation sign up so that you can get on our list in many ways. Um, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Um, if you have other questions, you can definitely email the economic development at gov.dc.ca email address, and I will pass them on to our speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Robert and Tom and Graham, for being our guests today. It's been a slice. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Thank you all. All right, I'm going to turn Thanks, it all. I'm going to turn it all off. Here it goes. Bye, everybody. All right.